I have a few bits. You have some. Okay, you know what bit this. you know what bit I was thinking about today? What's uh that? you know, how fast can you put on your hat? <laughs> oh, that's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a video. We should share we should share that video if we mm-hmm. can uncover it. But mm-hmm. yeah, I'll just like try and put on put go from holding your hat in your hands you know, like at waist level to putting it on your head. How fast can you do that? I remember that. And you can do it remarkably fast if you really try and you practice at it. But yeah, practice. You I could also like get injured. You guys <laughs> just like put so much force through your body. Like you were just trying to move your body with as much power as possible. So rarely did it actually work because well, the, you were so focused <laughs> on just like pushing it, you know? Well, the technique is you want to flip you want to flip or f- flap the, the, the hat <laughs> right onto your head into such a way that it just like instantly attaches to your gourd. And then like, <laughs> that's what it is. So it's like a slapping motion. You're trying to slap the top of your head with the hat as fast as possible. So just but like with, such, with such a grace that it just kind of flops into place. What sucks is when you get the hats <laughs> with the metal, the metal thing on the back. See, that's where that, you would get injured. Ouchie. Yeah. yeah you just like flip scary. and it hits the... Like the back part Maybe of your yeah. spine or something. <laughs> <laughs> just like, Damn. just, ooh. Yeah. But, you know, that was a good bit. I don't it know if that's a bit. bit. I don't know if that's what you call it, but. I think I have a lot. Of, I think I actually have videos of you guys doing that. I hope so. Because, uh, like, it's honestly, when you see it, when when I saw someone else do it, finally, I was like, wow. <laughs> I can <laughs> do this for that's hours. That's entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but. uh you know, there's, there's, there's more stuff to be uncovered. There, we'll revisit that in the future. That meme, meme bit, whatever. Yeah. Um. Does this sound like good? The earth, yeah. I feel okay. like the earth is playing a bit on my nostrils. Mm. Oh. Yeah, man. You need to like get some hot water, some steam up in there. Yeah, or like some campfire smoke. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that <laughs> that really help. clears you out. <laughs> I need to get one of those nostril things, the pot, the, the, the fucking... What are they called? Nessie pot? The old man. Yeah. That's not natural, man. Is no, it? it is I don't it like that. Listen, that stuff, it works. It works. I'm not That's saying what, it doesn't I, work. I want to know, know if it's legit or not. That's kind of what I... Like, is it get healthy for me? God <laughs> didn't want us to have that kind of... <laughs> that kind of control over our nostrils, you know. <laughs> God didn't want us to assert our 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 dominance human on our dominance. Nostrils? Yeah, on that part of nature, he cut that off from us for a reason. But don't we use our nostrils wrong or whatever, anyways? Well, uh, we don't breathe out of our nose, or like a, a big portion of people don't do that. And, and we're supposed to, right? Because I remember I, I listened to that po- that episode actually you guys did the other day. See, that's and I was like, oh. <laughs> that's what sucks about the allergies, though, is it can prohibit me from breathing out of my nose. So then I'm yeah. thinking about that and I'm like, well, yeah. then you're a mouth breather. I really wish I could. I'm an involuntary mouth breather. This is bullshit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Involuntary mouth breather. No, that's that's where I was when I was sick last. Like, and it's hardest when you're going to sleep mm-hmm. and there's just yeah. no breath coming through your nose. Because for me, I'm constantly thinking about my breathing and or trying to and just breathing through my nose like really deep and so when i can't do it it just makes me kind of panic yeah mm-hmm. but it's like a fake panic because it's like oh i can actually breathe my lungs are still filling up and all that but anyway the the like scientific argument which maybe some people would disagree with you know like i don't understand it from first principles but it's basically that the nose is designed to like filter yeah. the oxygen and that actually you receive more oxygen through breathing through your nose. Mm-hmm. Like it goes straight into your lungs in, in such a way that's more instant and, and filtered. And and it's just the mouth is more of a backup means, like, as well as eating. Yeah. But, and I, I don't know. And it, it kind of makes sense. I just, like, I've always heard if something, if there's science behind something and it's kind of old and timeless... I feel like that's one for me. It's like uh, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna probably do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's just like good. Because just breathing through your nose is such a classic, kind of timeless, or or mouth breathing so that is idea. Is medical cocaine? Medical cocaine. <laughs> that's it's pretty true. Timeless. It's pretty um, timeless. <laughs> that's well, true. well, yeah, no, but kidding. but I don't know. Like the cocaine leaves. 
yeah, or whatever. No, I'm but sure there's in, medical in the way that we powers. process it, you would argue that if it's like super condensed, <laughs> mm-hmm. like 10x times condensed from what it would be in the leaf. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like that's a lot different. But if you're just getting coca leaves and you're just packing those bad boys in your gums, or see, whatever. I've always wanted to try <laughs> yeah. that. I've I've always wanted. I've like I wouldn't try coke, but I would try the. I would try eating the coca leaf. I feel like that would almost be more that. intense. I don't. Do you even? Is I that what you do? I eat it, it or pack be, in your gums? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I've heard of people doing that when they're harvesting with real coca. Oh. Yeah, like the leaf, like the plant. Oh, they'll yeah. just eat and chew coca on leaves. it, and then. I feel I've heard that it is similar to coffee, like really, really strong coffee. Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to something like that. <laughs> personally, would, yeah. Well, that's like uh, we were talking about ibogaine, or no, not ibogaine. What is that plant we were talking about last um, week? That's like you can make a drink out of it. It's really bitter, and it's like a replacement kratom? for kratom. Yeah, that's oh, it. Oh, isn't that the drug that makes like your body rot off? No, that's crocodile. Oh, sh- okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Okay. Kratom, Kratom, like plant matter. Crocodile is a crocodile. Of- Wait, Kratom is what they saw. Like that sounds like a brand of sometimes. pickles. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's still like a lot of controversy around cra- uh, Kratom. I thought it was Kratom. I think it's I, it's <laughs> it's probably Kratom. It's probably both. <laughs> yeah, I think it, I. It, what's weird about it is, in large doses, it's a opioid kind yeah. of and then in small doses it's a stimulant that's so crazy but crocodile is a bunch of cleaning products mixed together with like gasoline and a bunch of other oh, shit oh my god and apparently you do it once you're addicted but it sucks that's or something like that yeah. i don't get that i don't really get that i'm okay. too much i feel like i'm too much of a heathen sometimes i like things that taste good and feel good so i feel like if i would do a drug that was addictive but it sucked i'd be like I'm good, man. <laughs> yeah. But I've also never been there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me either. <laughs> uh, okay, wait. Uh, on chewing coca leaves, uh, the centuries-old tradition of chewing coca leaves has absolutely nothing to do with cocaine. In their natural form, coca leaves provide nothing more than a mild stimulant akin to coffee. Brewing the leaves into tea is popular among all levels of Bolivian society. Among the working class, and especially those whose labor is physically demanding, coca is usually chewed. While chewing is a popular term, blah, 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 you basically line it in your mouth, generating a saliva ball. So it's ball. like dip. Yeah, yeah you, di- you just thinking. dip it. I would like that. I, w- I would do that, but I would prefer that over uh, Grinding tobacco. it up and snorting Yeah, like nicotine. Because yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, what like is nicotine. the difference, honestly? I mean, yeah. it's a plant, you know. A nicotine can be stimulating for people. Yeah, it is, absolutely. Yeah. And see, that's the type of stuff that it's like, yeah, I would do that in a second Mm -hmm. without thinking about it because like the plant i don't know the plant form of it like it's old it's old as time the way that people have used it just you're working out in the field eat a couple of leaves and then you don't have to drink coffee doesn't like dehydrate you you know like you can just drink water and eat coca leaves yeah (laughs) i feel like it probably is like it's i mean it's just the same concept as like any other stimulant like i mean coffee or tea because tea i mean there's so many different types of tea. It's and you can do that with tea, too. Yeah. You can, you can just munch dip on the, it. Munch yeah. on the leaves. Well, that kratom is so... Imagine how bitter tea can be mm-hmm. yeah. times 10. That's what kratom is like. Yeah. It's oh, have you tried it? It's nasty, yeah. Okay. I, I've tried kratom, too. Really? What was your you, you can, experience You can like? get it pretty commonly. I mean, it's not really an experience. It's just kind of like... It really a, isn't. A yeah. stimulant. People, okay. Well, people will use it to get off of, like, pills... Okay. Or uh, opi- um, o- opiates. Yeah. Or maybe to get off any kind of pill, I guess. Yeah. Because it could be a stimulant or it could be an, yeah, an opioid. Because I, I think I started researching it a while back. I actually forgot. But um, a, for it's like, I think it has pain management benefits. Mm-hmm. But that yeah. it's kind of, I don't know, risky. Like, you know, most opioid kind of related. Yeah. I don't know what the after effects are. Of yeah. it. I've only used it a handful of times and it was because someone was like, hey, do you want this Kratom? And I'm yeah. like, I, sure, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I suppose. <laughs> I knew a guy, though, that would parachute it, though, and that shit was just gross. Wait, what does that like, mean? Like, he would hmm. literally, like... You put it in the toilet paper? He would put a shit ton, like a baby's fist amount of Kratom in toilet paper and then just, like, 
you just drop it in the back of your throat and then like swallow like swallow. water yeah. yeah what but it's like <laughs> actually what you do is a, <laughs> what? that's you, called a parachute yeah. yeah yeah well you like peel apart the toilet paper so you get like, i swear the right layer. when i think i know the streets i mean <laughs> i used to, honestly i used to do that um not with kratom but with other things when i was younger and doing drugs yeah what like, a lot of because like, it hits you more instantly. Yeah, it's faster because you, you like crush like if you do it with pills, pills you like crush stuff. up pills and then you put it in there and then it just goes down fast and you don't have to like oh, snort you it. You like don't have parachute to, like, it down. And you're like oh go down a little trooper. You're like a, you're like <laughs> There's a, no trooper on it. Kind of like yeah. a deep sea bird and you're just like oh, yeah. <laughs> like a seagull or uh, whatever. <laughs> See, I, I yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. But, you know, I'll still try. I'll try anything. Yeah, I mean, it's probably better in a tea, so. Yeah. Also, it just seems like a lot, I don't know, <laughs> yeah. to try to, like, I don't know. I mean, the effects were probably really, really good doing it that way, but that's too much work for me. Yeah. To get that's that That's just too... I'd rather, I'm going to smoke weed. That's <laughs> yeah. too degenerate for me, like too, maybe that's the wrong word, maybe that's a bad word to say. No, I don't care. No, it's a little degenerate. That, like, if I was doing that, I might feel like, uh eh. There's well, at least at this age. I'm at that point, at that adding point, another step to the process so it feels more like you're doing something bad, I think. At that point, I, yeah. you should just get a pill press and just press them into a bunch of pills and eat like five of them. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. If you're like, yeah, anyways. Yeah, we yeah. could talk so, about this for a long yeah. time. <laughs> uh, we'll, 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 we'll talk about drugs plenty more. I can talk about episodes. drugs. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll have you on to talk, talk yeah. about drugs. But today. We want to talk to you less about drugs and more about dead stuff. That sounds good. That dead works. things, <laughs> dead animals. It's more relevant currently. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Michaela, welcome on to the podcast. Thank Hello. you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Um, you basically do work and are obsessed with the oddities space. What yeah. is What does that even mean? What are the oddities space? And is it new? Um, you mean like the, like kind of the oddities culture and like community yeah. or do you mean like my well, personal space? I, I guess I've only heard that term from you at all. Yeah. Is oddity. Like me, how I would have described it before is like boutique niche or b- boutique dark items or boutique handmade crafted olden items. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. Um, so it's, it, it's, there's not a good definition. So oddities, that kind of seems like. Uh, odd ni- knickknacks. Yeah, so it is odd knickknacks. A bra- it's kind yeah. of a term that I feel like can be pretty confusing, actually. Um, yeah, because like oddities can be basically anything that's just something that's not quite normal, quote unquote, or it's just something that's kind of you don't see all the time, right? Which is a lot of things, you know. Like I don't. I've been looking at this thing over here, wondering what that is for a minute. And it's I was, a walking stick. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 well, it has. It's shiny. It you know, looks, it's shiny it wood. Looks it's got a, bit a shiny odd. stick in my room. Well, you've got like instruments over here too, so it's like it could have been. I don't know if you were doing some experimental shit in here or something. You know, yeah, I'm doing experimental <laughs> shit in here sometimes. Yeah, um, but yeah, no. So oddity is really, you know, the oddities community that I'm involved in um, and kind of a part of is really based around like taxidermy and bones. Um, you know mummification, wet specimens, like a lot of it is the preserved remains of dead animals. Um, A lot of people, well, there, yeah, a lot of people. There's controversy around that. There is controversy, yeah, for sure. And um, not to me. Well, it's kind of, I think more people though in the oddities community, which is something that I don't think is really widely known and is part of why whenever people who aren't familiar with the culture look at it from an outside perspective, they assume that like I'm killing the animals that I work with, Mm -hmm. which is absolutely not true. Um, Mm -hmm. And I also don't condone that. Um, And that's how it is for most people that I've connected with. Most people that I have connected with don't kill their animals. They don't believe in that. And it's actually the opposite, you know, like we usually care very much about animals. Yeah, exactly. Like we're interested in biology. We're interested in the preservation and like learning from the animals, even in like a state in which they are deceased, you know, is there a history of people like past oddity sellers that would kill animals just to like have, 
Yeah. Really? Well, taxidermy. Oh, because okay. taxidermy is such a huge part of the oddities world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean. But that was almost like combined with already with hunting. Well, yeah, yeah I was. guess meant, I guess I meant like, yeah, different than hunting. Like I'm meaning like basically they would just kill them sole purpose to have something to taxidermy. It wouldn't be like someone killing it for food, I guess. Yeah. And then also like, making a taxidermy. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Well, actually, I just didn't know if there was like maybe someone in mm-hmm. history that was like notoriously like, yeah, there is that. really, there is a gentleman. Yeah. There's a guy. Um, I think he was from the, I mean, it would have had to have been like really early 1900s, maybe 18, like late 1800s. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember his name, but I could probably find his work if I did some research. Um, but he was actually somebody that kind of initiated that controversy because he's, he was specifically going and hunting animals like in Africa and whatnot, Mm. like elephants and giraffes and like really big, beautiful animals simply for like his art. Mm. Uh, he was doing, he had like this really big, um, art installation concept basically and he wanted to just just display mm-hmm. taxidermy mm-hmm. um and yeah so it, it i think that's really when it started i don't know as far as the research that i've done or the information that i've learned um he's somebody that's been notable to me um but yeah i mean some of the people in the oddities world definitely do hunt you know mm-hmm. and um a lot of times I don't know. I feel like it's more those people are suppliers Mm -hmm. for materials more than they are actually creating art or having a store that's, you know, like mine. They they more so are just like, I know that there's a market for this. Right. Um, Another way to make money. Yeah. And you kind of have to be careful, like depending on your ethics and what your. I don't know. Yeah. Like for me, I really try as much as I can to use materials that I know were ethically or like sustainably sourced at the very least. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really important to me because I don't think that it doesn't make sense to be killing the animals just for the art. Like that's horrible. I mean, well, and you've acted more as, and I've seen this, like you're more just scavenging Mm -hmm. remains that already exist and trying Mm -hmm. to make art out of them. So you're basically looking for, you know, already dead animals Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just recovering T- you know what's, what's left, there that yeah. would literally just turn into dust yeah absolutely. otherwise so it's like yeah it's not it it's just one of those things that's a little bit too nuanced for mm-hmm. people they're like oh animals that are not alive mm-hmm. yeah bad right like, yeah. And, and they just can't like you can't quite look at it with a little more nuance mm-hmm. and so yeah people are freaked out by it it's kind of it blows my mind because i'm i think because i'm so into this culture now that I mean, like whenever we went to set up our booth at room three, there was a lady that walked by who was so freaked. Like she was like taxidermy. Did you say taxidermy? And just because I like said the word, she was freaked out by it. And she (laughs) didn't want to like walk past our booth because she is so disturbed by death. Yeah, I guess so. And it's like, <laughs> it's so, yeah, it's really, because there is a lot of like psychological Yeah, I mean, aspects. everyone here is scared of death, so. I know. It, it makes, it would make sense that oddities are like, people are like, oh, I don't even want to think about dead things because I don't want to think about dying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then it's like the people who are in the oddities community were kind of more of this, this breed of people who understand that it's inevitable, mm-hmm. but we still appreciate like what we have now, you know, Mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know, just, yeah, we're not obsessing over the reality that like death is going to come, you know? Well, the, in fact, we've got the book right there on the bookshelf, the denial of death, uh, (laughs) (laughs) like that it's there, there, that book kind of talks about the idea that the denial of death is actually a very deep subconscious aspect Mm -hmm. in our psychology um, that has a lot to do with how we act, but also a lot to do with like why we suffer and why we make certain decisions. Yeah. And the book more just encourages, yeah, people to uh, like become accepting of their death and Mm -hmm. and talks about how past cultures had rituals or practices or Mm -hmm. stories that, would have people be familiar with their the idea of their own mortality. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and and kind of speaking of that, I was I was digging around for like early examples of, 
of taxidermy and stuff yeah. like that. And I found this uh, as documented in Frederick H. Hitchcock's 19th century manual, Practical Taxidermy. So the earliest known taxidermists were the ancient Egyptians. Mm. And despite the fact that they never removed the skins from animals as a whole, it was the Egyptians who developed one of the world's earliest forms of animal preservation yeah. through the use of injections of spices, oils, and other embalming tools. It's like mummification is actually what it is. It would be categorized as mummification. Mummification. Okay. Mm. As early as 2200 BC, they embalmed the bodies of dogs, cats, monkeys, birds, sheep, oxen, Whoa. and other pets of Egyptian royalty and buried them in the pharaoh's tomb. Mm-hmm. So it's, they were just like setting up like, here's the, here's the pharaoh, here's all of his pet homies. Mm-hmm. They're all like, the, the yeah. pharaoh's wrapped up to go. They're all embalmed. <laughs> yeah. yeah like, and <laughs> it's pretty crazy. That's, that's funny. But it's cool because, and it's like, it's their way of like respecting the dead, you know, mm-hmm. and like maintaining, I don't know. It, it's, Making it's a memorial. Making some kind of art and meaning out of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's physical that lasts just beyond I think that people are so uncomfortable mm-hmm. with death in their life. So that their, their go-to is like, okay, you know, like we're going to mourn and grieve and then we're going to forget about it. Like we're going to get, we're going to try to forget that this ever happened, that this person ever existed because it's too painful to, to address that, you know, and to think about the reality of it. So whenever you are like kind of almost, you're setting it up to where you're actually, you know, thinking about it more frequently and you're remembering that this person was something was living at one time and it was meaningful and it was an actually like a good thing. Um, and I don't know, you know what I mean? Like I feel like the preservation and like the proper memorial and stuff really mm-hmm. helps you be more honest. And it's kind of like in a way like exposure therapy, even mm-hmm. though it's, it just, I think that your perspective and your, um, own personal experience really changes how you feel about the entire topic as a whole, you know, yeah. like how you approach death. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to say on the topic of this book though, um, there is a mortician called, her name is Caitlin Daughtry. She's awesome. She has a YouTube channel called ask a, Mortor- ask a mortician. Um, and she actually has a book hmm. called the good death. And, um, it's, I mean, she's just amazing and very much along the same lines where she's trying to encourage healthy conversations about death. Um, mm. And <laughs> also she's she contributes to a lot of research of different types of um, like burials and stuff, you know, like mm-hmm. she's really wants to push the water burial kind of stuff. And um, wait, what's water burial? So water burial, um, it's some, or it's, I don't know if that's actually what it's called, but it's basically a process in which you use water to decay, help your body decay essentially. Mm. Um, and I think it's a more eco-friendly, um, Hmm. yeah, it's like, it's more eco-friendly. And so it, because actually like, you know, a lot of people, um, get cremated, but it's Mm -hmm. really terrible for the environment. It releases more toxins into the environment than I think even cows do, which is kind of crazy. Cause that was like, you know, their gases we learned were a huge impact on our environment. Um, but cremation is so much worse because I mean, you're just burning yeah. bone and like, you know, bodies and it's a constant thing. People are you constantly probably dying. honestly do more for the environment. If you were just, your body was thrown into like an actual loose grave and not even in a yeah. coffin. <laughs> if you exactly. just like let the body decay under the ground, mm-hmm. it'd probably do way more. Exactly. For the earth. Yeah. That's and so weird. She's It's also to weird to think there's sky burial. You can be cremated. It's a fire burial. You could be water bu- burial. Yeah, you can. Earth you burial. can be turned into a tree. <laughs> All the different elements. Yeah. Burial. <laughs> yeah. What I'm seeing here is like some company that mixes your remains with cement and pours the mixture into a form, resulting into <laughs> like a, <laughs> a statue or a structure. Interesting. Yeah. That's, that's a haunted uh, ass statue yeah, right man. there. There are companies <laughs> who will take like your. Um, like cremated remains too and, and make a variety of variety of different things, which a lot of people in the oddities, the world do that too. Um, pressed between a record. That'd be kind of cool. Your I know somebody, record. yeah. Or somebody linked me to a website that was like, you got your, um, 
the cremated ma- remains would be made into like jewels mm, and cool. you could use them for jewelry That'd be like cool. crystals and stuff i don't remember what the process is but it was really interesting do you have a favorite uh historical culture that used any type of mummification or like taxidermy or embalming i mean i feel like the egyptian culture is probably the most um notable and respectable honestly just because they i feel like we're so intentional Mm -hmm. um and so thoughtful and um yeah i mean i've never really thought about it honestly or done a lot of research on the different like what different people did for that i I haven't either i mean i yeah i have no idea yeah i think like in europe and um just in other parts of the world who their countries are much older than America and they've just got a lot more history than us. And, uh, they have like a lot of ossuaries, Mm. um, and a lot of like crypts where they would, you know, like essentially pile up Mm -hmm. dead bodies. I think that that's really fascinating at the very least. And, Mm -hmm. um, like going to the Sedlik ossuary in the Czech Republic or, uh, Kutnahora was one of the craziest things that I've ever seen. Um, which is, they also call it the bone chapel or the bone church. Mm. Um, and I mean, there were literally just human bones made into chandeliers. And, yeah, they just uh, constructed the whole building yeah. with like human bones. Yeah. Was it after the plague or something or was it just like... I don't oof, remember. They just saved... Honestly. <laughs> like a human bank, essentially. Yeah. A bone <laughs> bank. <laughs> That's, it's such a strange, something about it, like, I'm even thinking about this right now, it's tickling some part of me that's like, oh, this is, this is weird, like, what if that was my bones? I was just part of a chandelier. Is that, (laughs) is that like some kind of hell? Is that some kind of purgatory that you're made into, into an object of amusement when you were once a person? Or is that actually an honorable thing because your remains, which are just nothing, it's just material being used to make art? Yeah. I yeah. don't know. It kind of dances between like horrifying, but like beautiful and inspiring. I love it. Yeah. The year yeah, is no. 30, <laughs> the year's 3000. All, all <laughs> minerals and all mining, uh, all metals cannot be used anymore. All the buildings are human bones. Oh my God. Bones, bone buildings. <laughs> That'd be pretty amazing, honestly. Sky I mean, at least it's like, bones. there's a purpose for it, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. why would we, why are we just leaving things to rot when we can, or, you know, like, like we were saying, people have these like traditional burials and they're put into um, caskets and their bodies. I mean, embalming only lasts for so long. You know what I mean? Like you, you, a lot of times you have to continuously reinforce that. Mm-hmm. Like you have to keep up whenever you preserve something that's dead. You have to keep up with that thing, especially if it's, you know, a full sized body, mm-hmm. you know, like yeah. smaller taxidermy or mummification. You don't always have to worry about it, but life keeps moving. And, um, I mean, there's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's like a living matter, you know, it's mm-hmm. organisms and stuff. And so it inevitably will break down. And so it's just like a body of mush and a, like in a box Mm. (laughs) under the ground, you know, for no reason, like it's just there. And it's like, because people want a place to go bury the, or to visit their, you know, their lost loved ones, which makes so much sense. And, and I'm not trying to hate on it by any means. Um, but I just think that there are so many more intentional, thoughtful and, um, even like personalized, ways that we could be burying the ones that we love and, yeah. and making it to where they have the opportunity to give back to the cycle of life, you know, because mm-hmm. like we were saying too, if we were to just bury people in the dirt, then our nutrients would be taken from our body and given to the earth so mm-hmm. that more life could continue, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. that's pretty cool. Yeah. And something about jumping back a little bit, just like mm-hmm. the burial process the like how we do it here, you're almost cut off from seeing the body. You're cut off in yeah. every way. Like someone takes care of it. It's it's almost always a closed coffin. Um, or if it is an open coffin, like people don't want to look. People want to avoid it. And then we put them in the ground in mm-hmm. the end. We put them away. And it's kind of like, I don't know. There's something, there's something maybe that's like a little bit inconsiderate about that. Yeah. Or I, I don't know. But you know, bones 
our beautiful creation. Like we still can't make bones. Like Mm -hmm. we can 3D print plastic or, you know, other similar materials that can take the place of bones. Like we can print parts and put them inside of people. And that's amazing and all that. But still, we don't have the ability to create, you know, like this, the shape and the complexity of bones. Mm -hmm. And so there is something about like, Hey, are we just going to throw this away and let it disintegrate underground? Yeah. I mean, Uh, it's the same way with organs too, you know, like we are trying to replicate organs, but we still really haven't been successful. Like we have organ transplants, you know, which Mm -hmm. sometimes are successful, but it's taking one real life organ and, you know, putting it into another body. Mm. Yeah, and, and it, right here, what I see at the top of your page is uh, some kind of, and I'm on your Instagram right now, <laughs> some kind of organ in a jar. What is it? A rabbit? Oh, uh, are you talking about a the... A coyote. Yeah, a coyote heart and um, a fox heart. Wet specimen. Wet that's what specimen. Are. That's what they call it. Yeah. So, so wet specimen in a jar. is a organ or a little creature in... Like, in like a fluid yeah in a jar yeah yeah, yeah. so it's base. it's a very similar process to embalming okay. um it uses like i use a basically it's a diluted form of formaldehyde okay. to preserve the tissue um and then and it takes you know you have to in, in directly inject the organ or whatever mm. you're working with um, and then you also have to submerge it for uh, several weeks, depending on how large the specimen is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you do like a rinse bath and everything. And then um, you preserve it in alcohol, basically. Okay. Um, and, and some people, ha- there are some other more natural methods I've heard about people exploring. Um, but that's pretty much the most traditional process for wet specimens is it's injected with 10 percent buffered formalin which comes from formaldehyde okay um but yeah and like i when i discovered wet specimen preservation i was like i was just amazed because i'm such a nerd honestly and i well it's like seeing what you're not supposed to see yeah and it's just i mean it's so fascinating to me just existence honestly and (laughs) biology and the fact that we're just here living Mm -hmm. you know and Mm -hmm. it's like if you take apart something a a body of something that was once living you see all of the tiny parts of it that you know that are the reason it it was alive in the first place like the heart you wouldn't be able to live without a heart you know Mm -hmm. and it's just this tiny little squishy kind of firm thing with a bunch of you know tubes and and like veins running through it Mm -hmm. and that's what sustains your life like that's pretty incredible um and I definitely when I first started like dissecting animals and stuff I remember um I did like a, a really tiny bird and I dissected the heart out of that and it just like blew my mind. Like it made me so emotional because I was like, it it just, I feel in awe thinking about that tiny little thing being what keeps that bird's life going or Mm. it was, you know, Mm. and it's something so out of our control. Like we don't, we don't contribute to the creation of how that works. You know, it's Mm. something so much bigger than us. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I just think that there's so much to appreciate and admire and to study and to just, that's kind of, that's my perspective is really just like the appreciation for life and the respect for life and which is much bigger than I am and something that I still can't even fathom. And I I don't even know where it actually came from, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, It's kind of the same thing, same way that nature makes me feel, which it is nature. Um, But this part of nature can interact with me or it could at one time, you know, Mm -hmm. but yeah. Is there like a, uh, do you have a wet specimen, like a wish list that you haven't gotten yet of like animals or whale heart? Yeah. Like, is there one like a a dunk tank? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, honestly, is that something you've even never thought of? Well, I definitely would love to have like, a fetal goat or mm. some kind of, yeah, like full bodies. I don't mm. have like a fetus of something. Yeah. Or yeah, I really love some people will do like the placenta mm. with, and the babies. Like if it's, um, 
well. if the animal, yeah, like if the mama had like, if there if there was a pregnant female animal, um, when they dissect it, a lot of times they'll find like mm-hmm. the placenta and the little sacs with babies in them, and people will preserve those. Wow. I would love to have a really big one of of some kind of animal, mm-hmm. um, but then yeah, just like I I really thought about a little goat. Um, I don't think I have any full body wet specimens other than my fish, to be mm. honest. Um, Wait, is that just because he's wet? Because he's a fishy? No, he's <laughs> no. I made him a wet specimen when he passed yeah, away. Yeah, he's a wet. He's a real wet <laughs> specimen, Mister Fishy. <laughs> he's wet his whole life. Oh my god! Yeah, no, it was. That's the first time I preserved anything that was my pet. Um, Whoa! You didn't. Then, you didn't flush him. No. <laughs> God. I th- uh, okay. No. Wet I mean, I never. life, a wet specimen in death. <laughs> yeah. Throw it into the toilet. <laughs> but yeah, I think just if I had to, I mean, or like a horse, like a little baby horse, mm, I would whoa. love to have. That'd that be a wet big specimen. jar. Yeah. Exactly. Like. What do you put that like in? A globe. In that- you have to like special order. Like a big ass glass barrel, essentially. Yeah, I think so. Something? I. There's a girl that I follow who actually did um, a horse the other day, and she ordered this big glass. Basically, it was like, wow. um, like yeah, a, a barrel kind of superhero, like villain, fucking little glass yeah. thing full of. Well, That's they're not crazy. that big though. Oh, okay. Like you, I mean, oh, it like kind of gets bunched in, almost well, like, like it press, it like could a press newborn. Well, okay, so if it's like a newborn horse, it's, I mean, it's... I guess it's not that big, yeah. Yeah, like, they I'm grow fast. It, yeah, And then true. they are, like, you know, in, in like, cradle position. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it oh, also was, like, that's true. Um, a fetal baby, then it would mm. be smaller, too. Gotcha. So. See, all, all of your stuff in, in, like, wet specimens and the taxidermy, this is, like, what you would find if you stumbled into the necromancer's hideout in Skyrim or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> like what, what would their dark like necromancer lab look like? Like what types of thing, weird, you know, weird orbs and mirrors and like mm-hmm. wet specimens and, and dead animals. And yeah, and that's basically all that stuff that you're collecting and like <laughs> making. It's so funny. I think at the last pop-up that we went to, we didn't do, but it was at room three or whatever. Somebody, this girl like came up to me and Vincent and was like, Oh, I figured out what to call your style. And she was like, Western or cowboy necromancer. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> that's pretty good. Cowboy necro. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's I mean, there's worse. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty accurate. I think. No, definitely. Yeah. People think I'm super creepy. It's weird. Cause I don't feel creepy. Honestly, I feel uh, the opposite. I'm no, I'm known you long enough, so I don't yeah. think you're creepy. But Thanks. you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe from the outside. But no, not really. It's just, it's interesting. Like, I really do think just, it's just people's like, uh, they're scared of death. I and mean, the, that really could be it. Yeah. I mean, honestly. And it's misunderstood. I, I like mean, most other countries, the people there, well, if they saw that, they would either be interested or they'd keep walking. Mm-hmm. And, and they'd people just be like, oh, there's someone mm-hmm. selling death things. Yeah. Like, Regular McDonald's eating Americans, they don't <laughs> find they're not quite subtle enough to enjoy the art experience yeah, of seeing like taxidermy like... or wet specimen. They're just like, ooh, oh, dead thing. I, I gotta like, say oh. something. Yeah. Like no, I like I, I don't know. It's just it's not it's not quite simple enough of a of a taste in art, I yeah. think. Hmm. And and like like you were saying, like I just want to resonate what you were saying before that just kind of the appreciation for biology and appreciation yeah. for nature because that's at the root of a lot of it and that's mm-hmm. that's what comes up for me um and like a lot of what has what well, for one made me happier made me more curious made me uh feel like i've discovered more truth has been a humility in in the face of nature mm-hmm. and humility in the face of uni- the universe and just kind of the mystery of who we are why does the amoeba split? Mm-hmm. You know, why does why does all does all of these chain reactions in nature happen to get mm-hmm. us here? What are the mysteries of consciousness and all of those things that we obviously talk about on this podcast? But yeah, you know, those are all they're kind of wrapped up and very related to me. But yeah, <clears throat> I agree. It all just comes back to just a humility mm-hmm. at nature and just appreciating the beauty and the complexity of it. And 
And it is this paradox at all times because it's so ruthless and unforgiving. Mm -hmm. But there's something beautiful about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And just embrace, like learning about nature and biology and life, I feel like you, you just get more familiar with holding both those ideas in your head at the same time. Yeah. And that's usually a good way to be <clears throat> stanced or uh, like towards life. But, you know, and that's exactly, I feel like what your art represents is, is holding both of these things like death and what's disgusting and what's horrible with like what's beautiful and really respecting and serving or reverent uh, to nature yeah in in some ways i think it's like the whole process too i mean it's i don't know when i think about it i'm like it it's kind of just like a small representation of who i am as a person you know because i mean i've always been kind of into more darker you know people would probably call it like a darker culture you know i listen to heavier music like i've just always been attracted to like the darker arts i've don't really take conventional routes in life. Like I never really have, you know, um, I've, you know, been somebody who's experienced a lot of like, um, grief and pain in my life. Um, but I also just have always tried to find the hope at the same time and like really focus as much as I can on what we still have that's valuable and, and, things that I can appreciate. And I think that like in pain, there are still things to appreciate. Like suffering is not, you know, something that has to be a negative experience at the end of, at the end of it, you know? I mean, it's, it's challenging, but like we can take what it is and be grateful for the things that we've learned and be grateful for the growth that we've had and mm-hmm. for the, and for the ways that it's allowed us to connect to others and be grounded. And, um, I don't know. I just, I feel like that's how I feel about most things in life. You know what I mean? I'm, I am attracted to the things that are not as, you know, like picture perfect or whatever, or just like kind of simple lost face over. Value. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like I want to see like the raw, like I want to have like the raw experiences. I want to know about the really rocky, you know, topics and, um, mm-hmm. and just, yeah, appreciate the whole process in that, you know what I mean? And to just realize that it's, there's more than what people think there is I guess I don't know I feel like that's kind of a maybe a confusing way to say what I'm trying to say but you know what I mean like yeah well it's more of just digging in and embracing the realities of life and its dynamics which Mm -hmm. is full of joy and like terror and pain and and growth and that they come together and leaning into that truth instead of kind of just going through the hardships and, and just trying to bury them away, kind yeah. of like with the body is trying to just hide exactly. hide it for its ugliness, but instead accepting it and integrating it in, really into everything. Mm-hmm. Being and, honest. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what I was trying to describe as what's kind of just improved my life and my thinking so much is accepting, you know, just radically accepting all of the hardships mm-hmm. and, and the, the both sides of it that come together and not trying to avoid it and, and really just understanding that majority of the suffering is internal. Mm-hmm. It's like in your head and in the framing of how you set the situation mm-hmm. and like practicing those, that type of thinking and practicing that framing, you know, I've, I've got to, to experience moments of kind of like really deep emotional pain mm-hmm. and phys- physical pain yeah. a few times. <laughs> uh, and, and really got to see the effects of it in the moment. See where it's like, oh wow, I'm actually, I'm I'm primed. I'm in a different stance now to mm-hmm. where I'm not suffering as much from this, or I'm able to deal with this with much more control yeah. and sovereignty. And it's just, you know, obviously we're getting philosophical, but it is philosophical. It, it is, yeah, it inevitably intertwined with with yeah philosophy you know art science all yes. these things are kind of intertwined with mm-hmm. what you're doing and yeah. you know that's why it's so interesting it's natural history like that's what it is mm-hmm. it's i mean 
I'm trying to get people just to realize that taxidermy, animal preservation, like human preservation, all of those things, like it's natural history, you know, it's like something that's been done Mm -hmm. for, I mean, hundreds of years, um, if not more, you know, and it's, that's what you see in museums. Like we go to museums and that's exactly what you see is like taxidermy and just like artifacts that are from things that were living at one time, you Mm -hmm. know? been to one sure. even before covid i mm-hmm. hadn't been to one in like years i want to go to the yeah. sam noble sam noble isn't that a norman is that the dinosaur one or they have like it's a like dinosaur like exhibit there yeah it's the natural history museum oh, uh, i, th- I yeah. think that's what it is that'd be fun to go to i've been to the one in chicago Ooh. The, like, does it does anyone like, have any wet preserved dinos <laughs> Sorry, nah, that's a dumb question. Let me check on that. <laughs> <They don't>, but <laughs> it'd be cool. I'm sure they got baby gators, but yeah, yeah. they do. Be good gators. enough, baby gator. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ooh, I'd want to see like deep sea fish, like ocean. Oh, yeah. Like fucking swordfish. Or... Yeah. Yeah. People do like jellyfish, that's which cool. I think would be really cool to have. Yeah. But they kind of just look like a loogie in a jar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know a ship in a jar. Can I get a shark in a jar? <laughs> yeah, you can. You People know? do sharks for that's like one of the first. You guys remember seeing like those sharks in a jar Mm-mm. at gift shops? Nope. No. No. You guys ever went to SeaWorld? I feel like I would have remembered seeing that. Like those yeah. little tiny vials. I feel like that's like the first wet specimen I ever saw. But like I didn't. Baby uh, sharks, like little baby sharks. Yeah. Damn. Mm-hmm. I guess. Really? I guess my idea was a super basic one. Then every <laughs> redneck at a. I mean, truck stop once one. <laughs> shit. Yeah. I thought you said taste. a shit in a jar at first. <laughs> shit in a jar? Like a formaldehyde oh my God. lump of shit. Well, honestly, if you get a good <laughs> enough looking one. I mean. <laughs> put uh, a date on it. <laughs> David, David, who we're going to have on next week, he he pooped a tooth turd one time. A tooth? <laughs> yeah, it looked just like the Tooth Sentinel logo. And, oh my God. and he took a picture of it and sent Holy it to me. Holy shit. I wish we could have kept that and oh, preserved yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> We was, we should have sold it as merch. That's what I had to pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For like six hundred dollars. You should have. <laughs> Tooth tookie. <laughs> That'd be the first. A tookie. <laughs> a tookie. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Hashtag um, tookie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Michaela, I'm on I'm on your pages right now. Yeah. You've got uh so on Etsy, your beloved bones. Looks like just one, no space. And then Instagram, beloved bones, underscore, underscore. Two underscores. Uh, <laughs> two underscores. But a lot of cool stuff here. I mean, there's uh, on your Etsy, we've got Hella Bolo Ties, yeah, mostly which we haven't ties talked now. about. Yeah. And then your Instagram is all sorts of stuff. Some of the stuff that, so you're like collecting antiques, Victorian and religious esque antiques, mm-hmm. along with taxidermy and some some of the stuff we've talked about. I see like antique mirror, mm-hmm. a lot of rosaries, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. picture yeah. frames, last rites, crucifix, some art, religious art, and stuff like that. So a lot of a lot of stuff that's kind of encompassing that necromancer, I guess, <laughs> vibe we were talking about. Uh, but like, yeah, these these bolo ties you make. Some, I mean, definitely the coolest bolo ties I, I've ever seen. Thanks. I mean, how often do you get to see yeah, cool bolo true. ties? Most Thanks. of them are really old, too. I mean, well, yeah. back in the day when I'd see them, they're becoming a little more popular now. Yeah, but it's like, picking up again. Yeah, they've always been super old, so it's cool to see ones that are brand spanking new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I got to show up to a few weddings with this black scorpion oh, yeah. bolo tie you let me borrow. And people thought I was really badass. So. I actually didn't make that <laughs> one, uh, to be honest. Oh, really? Though. No, I didn't. But um, I did make yours. Are cool. Yours are cooler than that one. Honestly. I've made. I made mm. one for Ruben for his wedding. Actually, though, he had me make him a custom one, and it was really special because Tyler actually gave. He like donated a scorpion that he had in his collection because oh, yeah. Tyler yeah. just like collects bugs mm-hmm. and, and his kids collect them and stuff, and it's mm-hmm. really cool. Um, so it was super sweet because you know they're good friends, and I I appreciate and. Um, really love and value and respect both, you know, Tyler and Ruben. So it felt mm-hmm. really special. And yeah. then it was because Ruben's mom is a Scorpio oh, that he okay. wanted to get a scorpion mm. for like for his wedding. 
So that's, that's, yeah, that's it was cool. really special. I loved it. It's like my favorite one to do, I think. Probably. That's, cool. that's great. These are cool, though. You've got rat skulls in here. Bat, Bat skulls. skulls. <laughs> I got my letters mixed up. I that's, think I did do a rat, or I did a, I did a rat one for Preston uh, Pettigrew, actually. And he wanted me to, like, intentionally make it, you know, look more punk is mm-hmm. always how I describe Preston for the most part. You know, he just wants everything to look a little more worn down so i like busted out the <laughs> orbital bone or whatever um i'm actually about to start making some with like butterfly wings and moth wings and preserved hearts oh that's um, cool. wow yeah i think those would be cool i'm excited about that <laughs> that sounds really neat and i also am about to do a collaboration with um this girl named Brittany who has um her own like metal work she does like everything herself um she makes jewelry, just beautiful jewelry. Cool. Um, and she like does like chains around the border and she uses a lot of turquoise, mm. just like natural stones. Um, Chris actually connected me with her oh. and, um, it turns out she actually already knew who I was and was following mm. me, which was really felt kind of crazy whenever yeah. I'm like, you're an amazing artist. Like yeah, yeah. her stuff is like, I mean, super nice. Cool. Um, but yeah, we're going to do a collaboration together and I really want to do some rings because mm. she makes really awesome rings. Um, and I think it'd be cool to put like some tiny hearts mm-hmm. and um, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't quite figured out what else I want to put in them, but I think maybe doing like some a little mouse paw. Yeah, something. that's what I was like. Maybe something, but I'm like trying an to think eyeball. like, do you guys, <laughs> I know I was like an eyeball. I thought about that too, but I'm like, do people actually, cause I, for me, like I want stuff to stay kind of classy, mm. you know? That's, I had a little bit of a hard time getting into like the rat taxidermy for that reason because I yeah. feel a little goofy about it. Mm-hmm. But it's like people <laughs> love that shit. So yeah. whatever, you know, and it's it is fun and I like doing it. Mm. And so I kind of, you know, gave in there. But I'm like, do people like I mean, I know somebody will. But whenever you if you were to see like a ring with like a, like preserved hearts and like paws, mm. would you think that that looks like? Like you could wear that to a formal dinner I or would. would you wear that to like, I don't know. A show or something. Yeah. Like a punk fest or like. I mean, I would wear it to a, a classy rainbow. event, but I also, okay. mm-hmm. I also, I think underdress a lot. So like, I mean, I'm, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> I would wear it to any classy event and okay. I, I want to yeah. get one. So cool. So like if I have any fancy work dinners. I can wear it. It would be yes. a talking point for sure. Someone it it would is. be like, that's a really interesting ring. Like that's probably what you would get most of the time, but I mean, yeah. it would strike up a conversation. Yeah. So, yeah. I guess that's kind of what matters, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, how did you, so like you're making all this, you got taxidermy and bombing wet specimens and then these bolo ties mm-hmm. with specimens inside of these, like how long, like, when did you start practicing anything, like, the most primitive version of this craft? Like, when was it? What okay. was it? And just a little bit, step us through the journey, like, kind of glaze over it. Yeah. Because you're at a pretty advanced level, and it's almost, if I have hadn't have been paying attention, like I have been to your stuff, I would be like, whoa. It would almost have snuck up on me, because it seems like it's happened fast. Obviously, I know it's... It's not been fast yeah. from your perspective, but when did it start? Yeah. Um, so it was, <laughs> let me think. Uh, I think it was about seven years ago, six or seven years now. Um, I was, I think I was 19 or 20. Um, and I basically had just started picking up roadkill and that's where it started. <laughs> like literally that's where it started. Um, I mean, I think I'd like collected some bones here and there that I maybe just like found around. Um, but I, I was like when I started actually learning that this was a, this was a culture, there was a community of people who actually did this and some of them did it full time. Um, and I really just started following those people and reading their blogs and like just going through their social media accounts and, um, looking at their websites and then that, that kind of just made me really feel, um, more interested in, in giving it a go because I just thought it was super cool. 
Um, and so, yeah, I started picking up dead animals and taking them to my parents' house and dissecting them in the backyard and like burying them on the side of the house. And like their neighbors <laughs> would send them emails and be like, there's some, your daughter is doing something really weird on the side of the house. <laughs> yeah, they Can thought you please you were like one of those serial yes. killer kids that like kills cats. <laughs> my parents did too though. Like my parents, which my parents. You kind of fit the profile. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm sure you did when you were that age. Whatever. <laughs> or wait. Uh, that was not even that long ago. Like you've known me since I don't know. Like, Whatever uh, gets me out of this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, my parents like always, just because they're so, I don't know, they're pretty reserved and stuff. I think when I was younger, they were pretty concerned about some things, but yeah. um, just misunderstood um, with a Z, you know, Yeah. Pink. um yeah so i but i don't know eventually what happened is i took my mom to the museum of osteology or we we went together Mm. and she was like okay she got it she got it Mm. yeah she was like this is biology Mm. this is science you know like this is exactly yeah that's what you always. You're tell looking the like that's what you want <laughs> yeah. them to think. No, <laughs> no, it's that's no, that's that's just what you tell your parents like all the time. It's science. That was it me is with though. Pot, pot in high school. Mom, it's science. <laughs> it's botany. It's an experiment. <laughs> no, but it really is though. It is science. I mean, that's exactly what it is. Just like video games, like mom, it's technology. Come on, yeah, I'm learning science. I'm learning about you know like war tactics <laughs> in a video game. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm connecting, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm connecting with people across the world, Mom. <laughs> right, sorry, go ahead. No, it's cool. No, yeah. So kind of started there. And um, at the time, I was hanging out with Irvin a lot. And I'm sure you guys remember Irvin. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And out. yeah, he was like the real homie and would do a lot of the stuff with me. And like, I picked up a a full coyote and a full beaver like within the same week, I think, or the same day. I'm not really sure. But he let me put it, put them out on his family's land in Arcadia. And that was like when I was just did not know what I was doing. And so I literally just put the full carcass (laughs) of both of these animals in tubs of water. And I left them in this like shed thing. For two years. Dang. And then we went back two years later and got them and drove. For, <laughs> uh, uh, this is literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It, it oh, literally is. This is like. Okay. Have you seen Breaking Bad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Is this is this how that ends? <laughs> but maybe less not through the ceiling. Oh, wait. Hold on. Oof. Okay. No, just continue with the story. Wait. Never mind. Never mind. I'm thinking about when they melt that dude's body with acid, oh, but God. they do it in the bath. <laughs> oh, that was honestly, those are t- they're two separate kinds of feelings, but also kind of similar. Mm. I just have never seen maggots that size before. <laughs> and, and that amount, like it literally makes me feel like I'm gonna like start crying. Like I'm gonna I'm my eyes are watering up because I'm like, it's intense. And it was yeah. like it it definitely kickstarted this actual kind of small maggot phobia honestly mm-hmm. i hate them yeah i hate i don't think anyone likes them, them. <laughs> it's crazy though i hate them and i work with like i have to be exposed to them and i choose to be exposed to them still but i hate them they Dang. freak me out and there was i mean literally like there was thousands of them thousands Ugh. and that shit spilt in my car Ugh. yeah it's still in there i'm not gonna lie like it wouldn't cut like not a lot but there's like little drops of just like macerated coyote and beaver in my car <laughs> it's yeah so we literally we were driving from arcadia so like far out edmund you know all the way to valley brook south side mm. with these two animals and we just had all the windows the, uh, down. Did you crack the windows? Oh, yeah. All the windows were down. <laughs> we had masks on and I was driving like 85 the entire time. And so that's why like the water was like sloshing around. Yeah, you know? but you were just like, keep the airflow going, Yeah, please. I was like, just, fu- oh. and we were just yelling. Like we were just, you know, in mm. it because it was horrible. And then when we like got there and we opened the lid, I was like, holy shit. Like, I, why? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we just ended up dumping the both the tubs out in my backyard, and oh, um, <laughs> God, <that's stink. laughs> it was so bad. Mm. It was so bad, and like even though the the beaver had been in there for two years, the stomach was still completely like 
intact, intact because wow. they're they're so tough like their bodies are just so wow. tough but poor Irvin, i was like if you dispose of the rest of this stuff i will give you parts of the bones and i'll make you stuff and he literally like i'll never forget the sight of him just like carrying this big ass tub wow. of maceration maggot nastiness and like uh to this like ditch <laughs> in the um little what is it called we lived in a I don't know. It was just like, yeah, cul-de-sac. Uh, there's like a ditch on the other side and he was just like waddling his way, like trying not to (laughs) spill it. And he like dumped it out. He's a good friend, honestly, a real one. Wow. So pretty humble beginnings, (sighs) humble, (laughs) honest, rough, rough. Yeah. Nasty beginnings, but yeah. And then like, you know, my parents had like rabbits Mm -hmm. and they also had dogs. And so (sighs) they just kept, killing the rabbits which Mm. i was not happy about but they eventually started you know offering me like do you want the rabbit Mm -hmm. because we're gonna throw it away otherwise you know um and like i said like i yeah just oh yeah and i think that that's actually when i when my parents started offering me rabbits is when i started actually trying to like skin them because i learned like you're supposed to remove as much of the tissue as you can yeah, before so you actually rot or anything. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's just like, you have to dig through piles of macerated tissue yeah. to get the bones out. And if the that's, tissue's connected to the fur and then the fur gets everywhere. And, and it's organs and it's yeah. stomach bile and it's food and it's t- yeah. teeth and it's nails. Like, I mean, it's, yeah, it's just disgusting. It's a mess. So I, yeah, I started skinning the rabbits in my parents' backyard and, um, it's one of the first like animals that I fully processed, I would say correctly, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah. And then I just like kept following people who had more experience than me and I kept asking questions uh-huh. and just when I first like that long ago, there was not nearly the amount of resources there are now though. I mean, Mm. I was like searching the web for hours and hours and hours and not even knowing what to look for, like not even knowing what questions to ask, but just trying to find out like, how do I properly clean a skull from an animal, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's, cause there's also a lot of methods that people use that are really sworn against too, you know, like boiling and like using real bleach but you have to sanitize it. And most of the time you want it to be whitened because animals are greasy. And so, um, yeah, I kind of, a lot of it was just trial and error. And that's why I feel like it's taken me so long, like seven years to get to where I am now, because I didn't have anybody to show me how to do this stuff. I didn't know anybody else that was doing it in the first place or like not personally. Um, and, uh, yeah, but what changed everything for me, I think, is finding all the Facebook groups. Mm-hmm. Like that really that and then like discovering that there's an Oddities and Curiosities Expo based out of my own, you know, my home state, which is I'm just really grateful and lucky. Yeah. Um cuz I was thinking like, man, I'm going to have to go to college and like get a biology degree to ever be able to do anything in this realm. Like I'm never going to be able to get a job anywhere. Yeah. I'll have to go, go like work at a museum. Like I've literally applied for the Museum of Osteology. I've taken them my resume and my portfolio, I think five or six times now. Wow. They still won't hire me. Dang. Um, but it's because I don't have any kind of degree really. Yeah. Or like ex- quote unquote experience or right. whatever. They like, might. Whatever that means in the, professional yeah. world or whatever mm-hmm. no yeah Cred- credentials yeah exactly so um but yeah no the facebook groups literally they changed everything because that's where i buy most of my products from my materials that's, that's cool. where i take you know inspiration that's how i get um like notified about events that's how i you know, just connect with other people that are really Mm -hmm. pursuing the same dream that I am and are doing it successfully. Mm -hmm. That's who I, that's how I got connected with the guy that I, um, get all of my skulls from now. Um, yeah. And our taxidermy actually, when we buy taxidermy, that's already done. Mm -hmm. But so it's been a lot, it's been a long journey, honestly. (laughs) And I've almost like wanted to let go of it a lot, but Mm. I just can't like, it's the one thing that I feel like I've really pursued that feels so right and worth all of the, 
the exhaustion and, and disgust mm-hmm. and nastiness and, and trial and error. <laughs> yeah. Well, your story, uh, you know, just hearing it, so many things that we've talked about on this podcast come up. It's so many similar themes um, that, you know, we don't have to necessarily go over again. But I just, I always really appreciate, uh, you know, genuinely, people when people genuinely follow their interests and their passions, and especially from the beginning, like you're describing this, this gross, rough beginning mm-hmm. where you can't find any information, what you're doing is absolutely crazy. And in that beginning period to think, that could this this could ever become something that benefits me in my adult life like that would be a ridiculous thought but then if you because you kept on leaning into it and just kind of figured out that oh I actually want to get better at this Mm -hmm. I want to make these types of things and I'm curious and passionate about it and just going over iterations again and again projects again and again and like it's it's so cool to see that and especially the fact that you're saying like you didn't know anyone. Mm-hmm. It, um, so you're kind of jumping out of your own world because you have no connections to this mm-hmm. whole world, but you become interested in it. Mm-hmm. And you're like somehow with no connections, I need to go from here into that. Mm-hmm. And for me, that was very much how I felt like at the start, of, like trying to get into tech was because I didn't know anyone. And uh, and kind of leaning into the Internet is is what helped me a lot as mm-hmm. well. But like now you're at this point to where you're trying to basically take this. I mean, you have a you have a store that you kind of set up uh, set up at these one once per month expos or, or something like that, mm-hmm. pop up shops. So you do that. You've got this Etsy store, but on Etsy you're mostly posting these bolo ties. Mm-hmm. And then you're kind of, I'm guessing you're kind of doing deals in the DMs all the time with people, with some yeah. of the stuff you got on your Instagram. So it's a little bit, it's a, your stuff is a little bit scattered now, but you're basically at the early stages of where you're trying to start up like a small business or make yeah. this a sustainable, like full-time gig. And so, uh, you know, kind of what, what does that look like for you? And have you been kind of working towards this or dreaming of it or planning on it for a long time? Yeah. Um, well, so we did actually get a booth, like a full-time booth now, too. So the place that we, oh, cool. room three, where we do um, the pop-ups once a month, um, we have a full, we have a booth inside full-time as well. Um, the dream has, so I, for many years of my life, like since I was a young kid and started getting into the music culture, um, or I guess I was like a preteen or whatever, um, I've always wanted to open a music venue. Like that was one of my... Num- that was one of my number one dreams. And so what I kind of decided, I think, I don't know, a few years ago, probably like five years ago or something, was that I really wanted to open up like an oddity shop and a venue. And so that's that's what I'm working on now. Um, but for the time being, or that's what I'm working towards, I guess I should say. Um, I think it'll be somewhere between a year to two years though, realistically in in which Mm -hmm. that'll actually happen. Like I'll have my own, my own building that I can have shows at and do the shop. Um, but yeah, right now we are, um, inside of room three vintage, we have a booth in there and the owners, they actually like reached out to me whenever we did the pop, our first pop-up show and they wanted us to to be a full-time booth there, which was felt kind of crazy, you yeah, know, because show. yeah, I mean, and we did so good too. Like I was shocked. Like I was so, I was just not expecting it. I mean, I mean, I feel like we were really prepared. Um, and Vincent's, I mean, been just so great through this whole experience and has been super supportive and I'm really lucky to have his support and all of his help with everything. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. So, yeah, we just kind of, because the first pop-up went so well, I was just like, you know, I think we really do need to go ahead and, and get the booth and um, that it's going to work. And like I said, like the guys at Room 3, they want to curate more of that kind of realm in their mm. shop anyways because they're individually into that stuff. Mm. But there's not much of it in Oklahoma. Like there's virtually none. I'm There's just few people who have this exact expertise. I don't know anybody in Oklahoma City. Well, that's not true. 
I do actually, I think Macy like knows how to do, uh, I know she knows how to do some taxidermy and I think some other things like that. Mm. Um, oh, and there, there is a girl who has a company called uh, Amelia's Anomalies who does kind of oddity stuff. Mm. I know there are people around, mm. but it's like, I mean, nobody, ha- there isn't like an oddity shop. Right. There's like Craig's yeah. Emporium, but like, That's like I was saying hardly, earlier. Hardly. Yeah. yeah, it's like crystals <laughs> and like, it's literally he buys stuff off like Amazon in bulk and yeah. like, it's just. Resell. Yeah. Exactly. Like he's just trying to basically have like a, I don't know. I don't want to talk smack, mm-hmm. but whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just a little different, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so they, yeah, they're, they really see the vision and they really encourage it a lot. And I, I'm really going to try to keep building off my connections with them and my relationship with them. Cause I also really like them. Um, I feel good about the people that they are and I just appreciate their encouragement. And so I think, Oh, so they're going to start actually letting me teach taxidermy classes. That's kind of like one of the next steps for me is this summer I'm going to start teaching rat taxidermy classes cool. at room three. So they're going to let me do it there. And it's going to, I won't have to give them any percentage of my profits. I won't have to pay for it. Like they're wow. just going to let me do it at their space That's and awesome. they're going to help me promote it. Like I went in there to talk to him about it and just ask what he thought about it. Um, John, his name is John is one of the owners I was talking to. And, um, he was like, yes, <laughs> like absolutely do that here. Like no questions asked. What do you need? How much space do you need? You know? And then when we were like, I was still there, he just started telling everybody <laughs> that I was going to start teaching classes, taxidermy classes there. And I just love their like, no shame. Like, do we don't care if you're uncomfortable, like if this makes you uncomfortable because we understand that she's doing this, with like the with a, the right intention, right. you know, like I'm not just yeah. trying to like freak people out or like it's yeah. not even to be morbid, you know, either. Um, but yeah, so teaching classes is next on my list. Um, and I really think that I'm about to the goal is to transition out of working my full time corporate job mm-hmm. into doing Beloved Bones part time um, within the next three months. And so that'll, for me, that'll look like selling through the booth, but also selling through my Instagram and also maybe selling through my own website, which I need to get set up. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll get you going with something. Yeah. Like if, if we can't get a Squarespace or something, I could, I yeah. could build you a weekend website type of deal, but I'd love that. Yeah. You're, you're kind of just gonna have to ramp everything up, mm-hmm. but no, I think there's, I think that like your stuff has a quality, like a very high quality, but it's also a specific aesthetic Mm -hmm. that is hard to find. And so we were kind of talking about this earlier. Like, I think there's a huge market for this stuff, but it's not quite mature yet. Yeah. Like a lot of the people are still young or they're not buying more boutique or craftsman items, Mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. But you know, like you, the, you can't find the stuff really anywhere, mm-hmm. almost unless you're in a city that happens to have like a oddities shop and an oddities community that contributes the products to those shops. Because, mm-hmm. like, basically, the products they come from from craftspeople who yeah. are who are masters or at least very proficient at working at this stuff and has have seemingly done it for years, like you have, and yeah. I, that's so cool because it's just, you know, for me, the internet has so many opportunities or it, it's yeah. opened up so many new avenues for opportunities for people, you know, especially in the art world or just in the cracks in the in-between yep. spaces. And so hearing about stuff that like you're doing and, and following your stuff, it's just so encouraging and it just makes my imagination go because yeah. it makes me think like wow what what could i do what could i contribute or what what's going to be out there what kind of people are going to be unlocked or are going to have their art be discovered and be able to work on it full time because of just the diversification of you know of, of products and art that exists online um yeah and so, and that is like where I think t- it, that's the main market for it is people 
buy these products online. And mm-hmm. so that's kind of mm-hmm. something I really have to like, I'm thinking Navigate about through. more and more because yeah. it's, I need to get familiar with shipping and stores. I'm sure can be annoying to manage like online stores. I can't imagine yeah. what that'd be like. It's just a lot of time. Yeah. But it's, yeah, yeah. Time and uh, time versus like the money of yeah. running a yeah. physical store. But there's also a lot of legality things that I have to think about too, which is kind of something not everybody thinks about, but like, working with dead animals like there's a lot of uh laws that go into place and every state has its Mm. own regulations Mm -hmm. and like i mean we have like federally you know protected animals that we have to be we have to know the law Mm -hmm. um and also then shipping laws like we can't ship liquids so whenever i ship what specimens i have to ship them without the liquid and like it's just it is a lot to think about but people Mm. do it you know and they do it really well and people I mean, people do this stuff full time. Like, it's kind of crazy, but it's not in Oklahoma that much. But it actually kind of is because mm-hmm. of the Tulsa area more than anything. Yeah. I'm sure the wildlife, like, crowd has a hand in it, too. Like, in some way, taxidermying and all that stuff. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Like, the, I guess I mean by, like... You like mean, like, hunter, the hunters? Hunters and, yeah, fishermen, just wildlife, whatever. Yeah. It's, yeah. It is really, like, a big mixture of all different types of people. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, some people are really just in, into it because it's dark and it's grim. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of what I was thinking about um, earlier is, like, there's also a lot of collectors who collect human remains. Mm. And it, that's something I'm seeing more and more. And it's some of That'd it is... Cool. Yeah, but some of it's kind of scary sometimes. Like when I, I see like these posts come by and it's like, I don't know, just teetering like, is this legal? Yeah. Like, but yeah. in some places it's not, but some places it is. It's also like whenever you're on the internet, it's not even just exclusive to like your country. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, people from all over the world. Mm-hmm. I think mine are mostly Amer- like US based and a little surrounding, but they're, it's not solely, you know? Um, but yeah, it's definitely the internet. Like, I don't know. I don't think that I would be successful, be able to be successful in this industry without mm. it, to be honest, which is kind of something that I like was worried about because I really didn't want to have to rely on like social media and mm-hmm. um, the making those like connections and stuff. Cause it's just yeah. something I really don't, initially like marketing and like doing that kind of stuff gave me so much anxiety and that's what that's what me and josh have (laughs) are always are always complaining about it seems like a necessary part of engaging with nearly anything yeah Mm -hmm. and and growing uh yeah it's hard and it's not natural to a lot of people and a lot of people just don't really want to do it Or, or it's like if you're a creator uh you're you want to create you don't want to be a talker you don't want to be a a storyteller necessarily Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm, but that's what you have to become yeah that's absolutely how i feel i just want to work with my hands and like do the hands-on work and Mm -hmm. yeah just hire somebody to do everything else but at the same time i am i'm grateful that i've been able to see like that now I can look at social media and just like the internet and have at least this extremely positive side of it. Um, that's, you know, shown me that while there is this anxiety that I have to kind of get over and this strategy that is inevitable that I have to, you know, I have to kind of conform in a way because Mm -hmm. that is how the world works these days. Mm -hmm. Um, and in return, it actually is getting me closer to my, the like the bigger picture and my overall goal so it's like it's sacrifice but it's definitely been i think it's been worth it for sure and it's helped me just kind of push myself to get over other anxieties outside of that too you know Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. i think once you just you just got to start doing it you know and look at how other people do it and Mm -hmm. just try to like replicate it with your own style and stuff you know i think that's yeah that's really helped me so you're you're good at it though honestly like you've done you've done great about (laughs) Thanks. About just like genuinely marketing yourself and not selling yourself short uh, with you. the stuff that you're making, but also without, I don't know, like whatever we're afraid of without being cringe or without just becoming a, a marketer, basically. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's cool. I would love to talk about that when we have you on again yeah. for mm-hmm. their episodes. Like 
the whole marketing mm-hmm. aspect and like engaging with other people with your art, especially yours, because it's so, uh, mm-hmm. I guess, controversial, like we were saying, yep. or can be. I'm sure you've met characters, too, through it. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like for all different types. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Like every type of person, I feel like. <laughs> no, totally. I, maybe maybe you can connect us to some weirdos. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, real. let me know what you're looking for. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, yeah, yeah, anyone. Anyone <laughs> who's hella weird. Maybe not anyone. But yeah, maybe not <laughs> Close anyone. to anyone. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. What, um, I definitely, yeah, have some interesting people. Cool. Good and yeah, yeah we're good ba- and interesting. Mm-hmm. I guess is the, al- the alternative. <laughs> I'll leave it at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're basically at my hard cap. We're at the st- stop. So sorry about that. But what? Uh, we're at the stop <laughs> recording. <laughs> okay. So, but it's been a good hour and some some yeah. change. Yeah. Probably. But we're gonna have you on again soon. Cool not too long mm-hmm. and we'll get into all of this other stuff again. Cause honestly we could probably sit here and talk for yeah, like three I, to five hours. I can just mm-hmm. ramble forever about a lot, Yeah, but that's cool. It's, it's been fun. So thanks for coming on. Yeah. yeah. Coming on. Thanks for having me guys. Thank you for listening. Everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>